All right, uh, welcome back from one of the biggest shows that has been ongoing. That's Aga from the old souls. Right now, it's time for the green economy, and we're talking about the panel discussion. I'm Ivan TV and Kana, and to those that have just joined us, welcome to Smart Trend for TV and the green economy specifically. Hopefully, it's been a good start to the week. It's Tuesday, the 12th of December, 2023. We are heading all the way to the fall. So just a few days to call it the end of 2023, heading into 2024. But then the question is, what have we achieved from the very start of 2023 to where we are right now? So many things, disappointments plus achievements. But then today, we are going to be talking about a very specific topic. So interesting. At the fall of this very day, we are looking at the end of the Conference of the Parties, the 28th Conference of the Parties. It's the Climate Summit. It's been happening in Dubai, uh, Expo City, United Arab Emirates. So most importantly, the developments from there will be so crucial in streamlining our way forward in, re in regard to climate justice, among so many other things. So joining me today uh, on the panel discussion, I have two lovely individuals. One is an expert in so many things, uh, is Dr. Paul Nduhura. He's an expert in energy, water, and then climate change, so that entire grid. And as well, he's a lecturer at Macquarie University Business School, one of the few institutions that are so passionate about sustainability. And then at the same time, I have a lovely lady called uh, Council Namanda Irida Majorin. So we shall be integrating and then looking at so many things, but most importantly, in regard to how best we can leverage renewable energy. Can what we have right now in the face of the so-called uh, energy transition be so crucial? The renewable energy, you're talking about the big, big portfolio. So can it be so crucial in transforming the water food nexus? It's a big question. So, Doctor, I'll start with you. Welcome to Smart24 TV. Thank you so much, Ivan. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here today. Thank you for having me and uh, good evening to, to our viewers. We are looking forward to a very insightful discussion for you and we hope that you keep tuned in and that you learn one or two things today from, from our discussion. Once again, happy to be here. Sorry. Interesting. Kasu, how are you feeling? I'm good. Good evening, our viewers. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to be here. Very well. So to everyone that's watching right now, we shall begin this conversation from a very lighter note. Today is the end of the Conference of the Parties that's been happening in Dubai since November 30th to where we are right now. That's the 12th. From a lighter note, Dr. Paul, any takeaways from the Conference of the Parties? We've looked at so many things from the least developed countries uh, fund to something so special, regard special, or rather the Climate Change Fund and then Uganda itself having positioned itself somewhere among other players. Any key takeaways? Um, thanks, Ivan. Um, yes, I think this COP has been one of the very unique ones. Um, first of all, because it's been one of the, I think, the most widely attended. Uh, when you look at the number of delegates that have been uh, registered by the United Nations Framework Commission on Climate Change. Um, it's estimated that around 90,000 delegates okay. registered to attend, and this is far greater than, for example, what we saw in, in the Egypt. Egypt COP of 27. But apart from that, I think there have been a number of good things to look at, but also some a bit controversial. One of the good ones is finally that the Los Angeles Fund um, has been established and started to be operationalized. We have seen that um, over 700 million United States dollars have already been pledged by some of the developed nations to support uh, developing countries, especially those that are already facing the impacts of climate change. So it's a good step. Of course, it's still under development. Currently, it's being temporarily hosted by the World Bank. Um, but we hope that uh, sooner or later, money will start to come from that fund to support the nations. Uh, Apart from that, you can think of uh, the fact that the negotiations are still going on, or they are supposed to be still going on, and end today. Yeah, but what we've continued to see is that there's been a lot of uh, 
ambiguity on the language that should come, especially addressing the issue of fossil fuels. Okay. Should fossil fuels be phased out or phased down? That has been the debate. Okay. How do you, which language should be included in the final outcome that is going to be accepted by many uh, countries? We see that there is a big group of countries that is pushing for phase out language. Mm -hmm. There is a big group also, maybe a significant group that is saying no, fossil fuel should not be mentioned at all in the outcome. So it has been, uh, I think, kind of difficult negotiations. I hope that um, a, an outcome that, that is balanced, that meets the needs of all the stakeholders can, can be arrived at. Um, but let's see whether that will end today or, or we still have to, to push for, for, for another um, 12 hours or 24 hours. Yeah. All right, so to simply put it, it's more of a question of a transition or an integration. So many things will be coming on. Castle Namada, we've had a very drastic week. In your own, own simple understanding of the local climate, from the floods to congested uh, roads, heavy traffic and all that, any takeaways from our trend in regard to climate change? How are we adapting? Is it, does the future look bright in regard to adaptation to the different challenges? When you look at the where we are at now as Uganda, Uganda as a nation, uh, we have climate change initiatives in place, but they are still quite lacking because some are discriminatory in nature. Okay. Because when you look at the the actors, because in terms of policy making where we have legislators we have observers and we have enforcers so there is selective enforcement for instance when you look at the luigi swamp saga okay. there were people who had started up a taxi park but they were quickly evicted you you can't be in the swamp you're doing this and that but when we look at let's say an investor comes up they want to set up a factory they will be given an opportunity and government will uh, slightly look away or act like maybe this person is not going to create that big impact. Okay. So I feel like this should be a lesson to us when we look at the floods, the different environmental degradations that are happening. It should be a wake up call because the environment is dying and we are seated, we are not putting in effort. We are comfortable with the submerging roads and Yes, everything. people just keep making fun. Oh, today the road has flooded this. But what is the root cause? We are not looking at the root cause. Why is this and this happening? Because right. soon it will be tsunamis, it will be hurricanes. And so many other things. Yes. All right, interesting. So policy vis-a-vis -vis our understanding of the food, uh, water nexus, but most importantly, energy, renewable energy, because most of the time you're talking about a transition. So how ably can we achieve the transition? Most importantly, in the eyes of climate change. When you talk about the Renzori uh, ranges, when you talk about uh, the Elgon ranges, so prone areas to mudslides, and then other collateral impacts of climate change. So, council, rather, uh, Dr. Paul, to start the conversation from a lighter note, uh, let's look at the transition itself. Uganda, we've been talking about this for some good time. Africa at large, and then the global scope still. I'm interested in understanding, and most importantly for the people that are out there, that are not so conversant with the energy and then the climate conversation. What would be the best uh, understanding of the energy transition? Um, I think the energy transition as a, um, as a topic, from the academia we usually understand it much easier and even communicate it. It started to emerge recently, uh, but it has actually been happening just that we had it coined it to make it, to call it energy transition. Okay. Um, in broad terms, energy transition means um, shifting from one form of energy production to another. 
Okay. <clears throat> and by that, you can already think of examples in our own homes that, that we, that, of the energy resources that we use. If you choose today and say, I have been cooking with charcoal, uh, but I want to stop charcoal and start cooking with gas. That is basically the transition from one form of energy to, to, another. to another. That is energy transition in its broader sense. But in more specific terms, um, especially when you look at it from this global debate that is going, well, that is ongoing, even at the COP, like we mentioned, uh, it refers more to a shift, shifting the global energy system from fossil fuel-based production and consumption to renewable okay. energy resources. Okay. And when we say fossil fuel-based, uh, we mean coal, we mean oil, we mean gas. Okay. okay. So, in the global debate, it is specifically it is not just from any energy source to any energy source. It is transitioning from those fossil fuel based resources, which are considered to be very polluting, to renewable energy resources that are considered to be uh, cleaner, sustainable, and, and easily accessible to everyone. So, broadly speaking, that's that's the energy transition. For a layman, I hope they can understand that. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I'll drop a little bit to the lady that's very close to me, Councilor uh, Namanda. In your own perspective, is the damage at hand? You just talked about uh, Luigi and how human activity has taken it on. And then we are talking about flooded roads that are submerged. Same situation which is happening in Kenya, Tanzania. You could talk about India, Libya over there almost everywhere. Is Uganda's burden that compelling that there has to be a drastic change? Yeah, I, I believe there has to be a change because uh, that is why the initiatives, let's say COP, they are coming up to have a move towards climate sustainability to reduce the aftermaths of the human activity that has caused this degradation. Okay. And then as far as environment is concerned, we are looking at so many key areas. When you look at the National Environment Management Act, it's right there. Yes. When you look at uh, the National Renewable Energy Policy, right there. And then so many other elements. From a lighter note, starting with the Environment or the Environmental Act, when you look at uh, Namave, the biggest wetland in Uganda, it's almost been swept away by industrialization. How would you, in, 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 a, in a simpler note, are we looking at the factors uh, that inform the drafting of the different policies, the different laws, as being inefficient enough to cover the climate uh, area? Yeah, I believe. Uh, they, I, I don't think there is a problem with the drafting at hand per se, because when you look at uh, the different areas, natural resource, water, environment, the different policies are in place. And behind those policies, there are enactments, acts, which are supported with statutory instruments and regulations. But it all co draws, comes down to enforcement how is the enforcement taking place? Because yes, we have the law at hand, but it's it's being trampled on, if I can say that. Okay. Because there are, we have the touchables and untouchables, okay. if I can say that. Because people hide under the guise of industrialization, we need development, we need to set up industrial parks, but you can't encroach on a wetland and think there would not be an aftermath. The aftermath is what is showing now. If you look at Uganda's current state, the floods, the mudslides, it's all an aftermath of not observing. So the policies, the legislations, they are in place. The legislators have done a good job, but it comes down to enforcement. 
Right, enforcement, and then so many other things. Uh, there was a time I was talking to a friend of mine, and he told me we have some of the best policies in Africa, and then perhaps even the world at large. But then he still asks himself, why are we still having these issues? So if you're having the best policies, why are we still having inefficiencies in regard to rolling out of these preservative measures? Doctor, to cross over to you, we are looking at, we're talking about energy transition, we're talking about so many other things in there, energy from fossils to renewable, among other things. I'm interested in understanding, in your own perspective, has the current burden that regards climate influenced the demand for renewable energy at the moment? Yes, I really think so, uh, to a greater extent, but not, not, not to say that that's the only reason. Okay? Um, to take you a bit briefly on the history of the energy transition, there have been several energy transitions that have been taking place since maybe the last 200 years, okay? okay? And all these have been influenced by different factors, okay? Um, if you look at the time, let's say, before the, the Industrial Revolution in the, in the 16th and 17th century, before that, humanity relied a lot on um, wood, wood fuel for cooking, exactly. for heating relied a lot on human power, you know, pushing things. Relied a lot on uh, these wind, windmills and water mills, okay? And also for transport, we relied on, on horse, horses, horses pulling carts or riding on horsebacks. Now, because of, of a reliance on wood for heating and cooking, there was an issue that shortages started to happen, shortages of wood, because people were deforesting, were cutting trees. Exactly. And then, because of that shortage, prices of wood were going up. So, now people then started to think, oh, we need to transition. The driver for the transition was the shortages and the economic implications of the shortages, so high prices. So then, now new technology came up, especially the, the steam engine. And then people now moved to coal because the steam engine could be powered by coal. Exactly. That started at, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Coal went on until oil was discovered. And then you have the, <coughs> the discovery of the oil lamps, so for lighting. The first stroke engine as well. Exactly. And now the ICE engines, when they were discovered, they were, it wasn't yet an oil boom then. The oil boom happened now after the World War II when now you had these large assembly plants of cars that came up. So that's when oil now took over and coal declined a bit. And then oil went on until around 1973. To, so the reason why there was a transition from coal to oil was more a technological innovation. There was an innovation. So technological innovation was a driver of that transition. But when oil went on until 1973, you remember there was an oil crisis during that time. And then countries started to think, oh, Maybe we don't need to rely a lot on oil. That's when the talk of renewable energy started to come up. So actually the first driver of renewable energy was the oil crisis, okay, of the, 19, of the early 1970s. But with the time, when countries stabilized their energy access, discovered more oil and so on, the driver for transitioning to renewable energy started to change. So countries started to realize that with the consumption of oil and gas, and of course with the consumption of coal as well, it was having an impact on the environment. How? These were releasing a lot of greenhouse gases into the environment, and these greenhouse gases were acting, were trapping heat, heat from the sun in the atmosphere, and then the world was starting to warm up faster than it was, it was warming up before. So now the driver for shifting to renewable energy now became the climate, the climate change. So yes, climate change is a big driver. And I think it's, it's now very clear to everyone that uh, there are people who are pushing for this climate change. Even individuals now can, uh, can push for energy transition based on their beliefs on climate change. Okay. We have uh, uh, now consumers that are more climate and environment conscious okay. who will tell you that, oh, 
for me, I don't consume energy that is going to destroy the environment. Mm -hmm. We see this, in, it's not yet maybe here in our country, but in some of the developed countries, uh, people will demand a specific energy source that they need. They say if you are a seller of electricity, and your electricity is coming from gas or oil or coal, I will not consume electricity. So they will get another, another, um, uh, another supplier. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, remember that climate change is also impacting the availability of some of the resources that we would normally consume, okay? So some of the energy resources. If you're thinking of wood, the climate change is driving extinction of some wood species, but also is driving increases in droughts, for example. So that hydroelectricity maybe will become riskier as climate change intensifies. So all these determine the demand of, of which energy resources, because if a resource is not there, it's hard to demand for it. So many, many issues that come into play that drive the shift of renewable energy. But again, it's sometimes uh, a chicken and egg question. Mm -hmm. So climate change driving extinction of wood or wood leading to wood consumption leading to climate change. So it's still a complex thing, but I would say that yes, climate change is a major factor in, in, in the energy demand of, of many people. All right, before, before I switch back to council, I will still pose uh, an interesting area to you, Doctor. We are looking at the agricultural sector being a key driver, not only in Uganda, mm -hmm. because as far as East Africa is concerned, we've been the hub, one of the biggest hubs for agro supplies. Mm -hmm. And then I'm looking at the biggest numbers employed in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. about 61% of the workforce enrolled in there. And then it's still crucial towards the gross domestic product of the country, about 24%. And when I was, I was traveling uh, in the riverine communities, and then I looked at some of the areas that are most afflicted right now, involved an element of agriculture. Crops submerged, besides the infrastructure, those are the roads and then the, house, uh, the households. I'm interested in knowing, as far as agriculture is concerned, how would the energy, renewable energy, and then the transition itself influence uh, a better approach towards revamping the sector or helping it out? Mm -hmm. That is very interesting, um, a very, very interesting question and pertinent because um, in our country, it is hard to find such discussions on that link energy and agriculture. Mm -hmm. So you realize that most of the planning that is carried out in Uganda is, is in silos, yes? Okay. So the energy people maybe are planning their own, for their own sector, the agriculture people are planning for their own sector. So when you ask such a question, it is pertinent because we need to start to think from this nexus approach, and that's the topic for today. How do these different uh, sectors interlink, whether it is agriculture, whether it is uh, water, and energy, agriculture, and energy, and so on and so forth. Now, to answer your question, um, energy has a very, very important role to play in agricultural development. Okay. You already mentioned how many people in Uganda are employed in the agriculture sector. Maybe it is 61, you mentioned it's 61%, or even, or even higher, mm -hmm. because also the statistics sometimes are not. They vary, and yeah, they vary a lot. lot. That is 61% of the workforce, Uganda's workforce, exactly. is in agriculture. But do you know how much energy is consumed in the agriculture sector? From the production to the harvesting, handling. Only 1% of the energy that is consumed in Uganda goes to agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And these statistics are actually from the Ministry of, of Energy. I, think. I was reading this in the they call it statistical abstract by the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. That is of 2021. So only 1% of the energy consumed in Uganda actually goes to, to the agricultural sector, including fisheries and, uh, and forestry. So what that tells us is that uh, the nexus or the contribution of energy to the agricultural sector is still very small. Okay. Okay. So, of those sixty, what that means is, of those sixty-one percent that are in the agriculture sector, the workforce, most of them are not using any mechanization. So, most of them are relying on their human power, either to dig, 
or to transport their produce. Okay, so no, a very very slight input or no input of energy, and of course you know without mechanization, your productivity, your yield cannot cannot go cannot go high. It's so, very very limited because as human beings our energy is very is very limited. Minimum, yeah. You're not like a machine. You start digging in the next one hour you're already panting. So. What we have seen from countries that have managed to transform the agriculture sectors across the world, it has been energy-powered mechanization, okay? It can happen at the production stage, so we are talking of when you are preparing the ground, or when you're planting, or when you are, you know, weeding, and, and taking care of the crops. So, and their energy can play a role, not only with, for example, what we all know the tractors for digging or the planters, but also if you consider that with climate change, we have to start to think of transitioning our agriculture from relying on natural resources, rainfall. Because now rainfall is no longer predictable. Mm. You don't know when the season will start or when the season will end. Exactly. You don't know how much rainfall will come this season. If it comes a lot this season, next season it is not coming. So what that tells us is that we may have, we have to actually, we have to transition agriculture sector from relying on natural rainfall to irrigation. And this is where energy resources can play a very, very important role. Okay. Especially if you're thinking of off-grid communities. And I think this is, uh, this discussion is looking at, at the smallholder farmers. Exactly. Because these are the main, the, the, the big number in Uganda. The biggest so, contributors. If you think of smallholder farmers, most of them don't have access to the grid. So what they need are decentralized electricity solutions, energy solutions. Okay. We've talked about the, the, the plowers or, or, or the tractors that can help to plow. Of course, these are now mostly powered by diesel and fossil fuels. Exactly. But I know that in some countries there are some plowers that use uh, that are electrically charged using batteries and they also plant the tractors. So we can think in Uganda what is available, we give it to those people. So use these fossil fuel powered tractors for now mm. to plant to, or, or to clear the ground. But then most importantly, to beat the climate change, to adapt to the changing climatic conditions, make sure that these people can access water for irrigation, especially using water pumping technologies. Okay. Where there is electricity access for the grid, you could use that connection to pump water either from underground or from a nearby stream and irrigate the crops. But where there is no grid access, mm -hmm. decentralized solutions have to work, especially solar powered pumping systems. Okay. If these can reach the smallholder farmers, it would make a big difference. Uh, loss of crops because of changes in weather patterns would, would be history. And people would be even able to plant. You know, now they say people have two seasons to plant, the farmers. Mm -hmm. But you can plant all year round if you have irrigation. You can plant. You don't have to depend on, oh, the rainfall is coming, or it's not coming. And even the two seasons are normal. And then, yes, exactly. So now you, you think of productivity all year round. And then shortages of, of food will, will be history. We would not be going through this. So energy has a very, very important role. And I've mentioned this is at the production stage. But imagine at the harvesting and post-harvesting stages. Critical areas. Critical areas. How much do we lose when we harvest? How much food do we lose after harvesting? Maybe 40% of the food is lost. But if we had energy set to power cold chains, at the parish level, for example, I harvest my tomatoes and I know I'm going to keep them in a cold, in a cold storage area where they're not going to go bad, exactly. and then I can supply them to the market. So still energy has a very, very critical role to play at that level as well. All right, uh, we are heading for a break, but when we come back, it's, it's one area that I'd wanted council to point me, to enlighten me. That's in regard to policy. Right now we are looking at a program-based budget. That's as far as parliament is concerned. And those are the people that drive whatever we do, the legislation. So when we come back, I will be so interested in understanding how best can legislation help transform the water food nexus and the connectivity of the energy still. So when we come back, that will be the pick-up point. But first, the break.
Smart 24 Driving Business. Jovia. Goyole kera kurugendo runo rubura mu. Nguwe kera bwe chamanya agatazizibwa. Amanyu kulabibwa no kuulirwa. Mu mawanga age wale nyo. Okutuuka buli wamu nga ya detogenze yo. Pensiyo nange kuli mu ngalo. Okutambula mu bisera no kumanya buli kimu ekirina okumanyibwa. Jovia kino kye kirabo kyange jyoli. Tewali kumu kuchikyo subiro kula kumukutu nanda mekwa ugwa MTN. Luxury redefined at Seasand Hotel as you indulge in the splendor of elegant living fit for the royalty that you are. Step into comfort, pampering and blissful customer-centric service as you select from our range of comfy exquisite living quarters furnished to meet with your royal preference. Surrounded by scenic beauty, our tropical setting allows you to escape the clamorous odor of city life. Our ambient green gardens will guide you to a place of revitalizing rest. The three-star restaurant caters to your palate, serving your choice menu ranging from exotic cuisines to local delicacies. Our chefs will serve you full course meals for a truly out-of-this-world culinary experience. Our fully stocked bar to wet your plot from renowned global brand whisks, brandies, jeans, beers and wines to our locally celebrated beverages, you will not lack for any brewage. It's an all new experience in the East at Seasand Hotel, so visit today at Plot 15 to 19 Spire Road Ginger or contact us on plus 256-751. 719-960 and plus 256-785-354-614 for reservations. Seasand Hotels, luxury redefined. Smart 24 Driving business. All right, welcome back from the break. And to those that have just joined us, this is the green economy. And most importantly, the panel discussion. So many things that we are looking into, but to precisely put it, we are looking at how critical the energy transition will be in transforming the water food nexus, but critically in the light of climate change. So many things are ongoing. When you talk about the energy, one element that you can't skip out or leave out is climate change, because you are looking at energy, agriculture, and then other key sectors being so affected in light of the different anomalies. You could talk about floods, and when you talk about floods, obviously, load shedding is one issue that, that crops up. But before we went into the break, I was basically interested, Council, in understanding, because right now we are looking at a program-based budget. And then, most critically, when you look at the allocations, they are tended towards certain areas. You will talk about security somewhere, taking even the biggest share. You will talk about some other programs, innovation in there, among other areas. And at the fall of it all, the office of the Prime Minister is always coming out to help and then throw aid to the most critical areas. Mm -hmm. Karamoja, for instance, among other areas. I'm interested in understanding if at all we can have supplementary budgets to support particular things. How best can we utilize legislation 
to transform uh, the water food sector or rather connectivity? Uh, we can advocate for more policies. As you are aware, we have uh, a private uh, before a law becomes a law, it's a bill, it pre it's presented before parliament, then signed by the executive. So if more individuals, us, who feel affected, because people up there are not feeling the impact, it's people down here who are feeling the impact of climate change. And with this, if there is no resource allocation, no, no activity can take place. So it all comes down to what are we doing, us as human beings, you in your capacity, how are you using the platform you have to reach out to people in power, to reach out to the legislators. Uh, there is an opportunity where you can present a private member's bill, uh, present it before parliament, uh, if it passes, it can always be passed into law, but also using the different platforms, let's say media, you cover stories, talk about now, for example, like this platform, uh, it's informative, it keeps people informed about the areas that are lacking, because people out there may, may not necessarily know that, oh, this, is, this and this is happening, oh, this is lacking, so it's all about taking up the platform that you have to use it to advocate for change in the different ways. All right, that's quite interesting. Mm. Doctor, when you look at the energy portfolio, it's growing. And right now, Uganda is considering areas such as geothermal, solar, wind, not to forget the predominant hydro uh, electricity. When you look at Kenya, Kenya is one of the biggest countries that are relying on the biggest renewable energy portfolio. And one of the key or the biggest beneficiaries of the strategy is agriculture. We just talked about uh, solar powered irrigation and all that. And this is one area that they, they are proud of themselves, judging by uh, the their placement in the Horn of Africa, or close to the Horn of Africa. They're looking at how climate, and then being largely dominated by arid areas and all that. And then locally, when you look at the Uganda Electric Generation Company, it's looking at uh, increasing the installed generation from 913 megawatts to 1,317 by 2028, which isn't so far from now. And then one other area that they are looking at is the sale of electricity mm -hmm. from 49 to 67%. Is there any way agriculture can be incorporated in this entire uh, conversation? Um, I have mentioned already that when you look at the Uganda's agriculture sector, and you also mentioned it, um, it's mainly employing smallholder farmers. Mm -hmm. Yes? So what that means is that Mostly, these people right. live in rural areas that are not yet served by the grid. Okay. And when you're talking of Uganda Electric right. Generation Company, with an electric transmission company, these are grid-based institutions, institutions, mostly supplying electricity through the grid. So the dilemma is there. First of all, it is going to be difficult to for smallholder farmers to use electricity when it is not there, when it has not reached them. That is why I talked about earlier the decentralized renewable energy solutions. However, the last part of the agricultural value chain, apart from production, harvest and post-harvest handling, is the value addition part. Okay. Part of processing, adding value to the agricultural produce. This is where the biggest potential is. Where beyond the industrial parks that we see today in Uganda, especially in, in, in the cities, Kampala, uh, Jinja, and so on, 
can we identify an opportunity to have industrial parks, mini industrial parks maybe, in near the production centers in the rural areas, and then the power distributors deliver electricity to those parks, okay? It has happened where government had this uh, policy of electrifying all sub counties, for example. Mm. And I think it has largely been successful. Most of the sub countries, if not all, are electrified. Mm -hmm. Okay? This can be the same way that electricity can be brought to into the agriculture sector. If you have small processing facilities, okay, of agricultural produce, say coffee. Uh, or, or any other product that is uh, bananas uh, or, or any other produce that is there. You have these small processing facilities in, in maybe one uh, area that is a mini park, and then the grid can be extended to those. Now, in this way, the grid will not only support the agricultural production, but then you find that surrounding communities are also going to benefit uh, from, from this grid extension. So yes, there is still an opportunity to interlink grid electricity with agricultural production, but I think at a meta, at a meta level. Okay. Until we have grid extension to the remote areas, we will only find minimal integration of the grid in the in the production and in the harvest. I can give you a story. It's possible, not that it is not, but I, I was I was watching a video recently. Uh, I think from Costa Rica. Hmm. And I was very surprised at how they handle the harvesting of their bananas, matoke. It is highly mechanized that when you go to harvest the matoke, because the plantation is too big, they have put in the plantation lines, connecting lines, that on which you hook the matoke after cutting it down, mm -hmm. you hook it, and then by motors, of course, powered by electricity, this thing is automatically transported, let's say, five kilometers to the plant, to the storage plant or the processing plant before it is packed for, for shipping. This can happen only if the transmission and the distribution lines of electricity have reached the rural areas. But as, as we stand today, with our 19% grid connection uh, across the, the country, I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, yes. However, I think we can, as mentioned, you can, we can use electricity, grid electricity, for value addition, for processing of agricultural produce, mm. and for packaging before we send it to the market. All right, you just talked about the national grid. It's one crucial area. But when you look at the people, the players that are into the agro sector, uh, the fishery sector, among others, they're not only looking at relying on government, because government itself is looking at public-private partnerships somewhere, and then private sector-led investment. And then one area that you would think about the investment is the mini-grids and then the off-grid systems, mm -hmm. where even solar is so crucial. And then I was interacting with some of the private sector players that are into the solar space, and then they told me one of the biggest areas, uh, the biggest challenging areas is regular taxation. And I'm wondering, in your own you've done, you've covered so many areas. In your own understanding, is there a way government can afford to lose out on big revenue for a critical area such as uh, energy and then scaling its, its, its usability? One thing that I, at least I know about the government is that any government works for the betterment of the people. Okay. So it's not always that money will go where the government knows it's going to have the greatest impact. At least that's what the expectation of, of, of any government as I understand it, okay? So I really think that government would be willing to lose, or in courts, lose revenue if it knew that that loss in courts would be going to have a greater impact somewhere else. So definitely any any taxation incentive that the government can give to private sector players, say in the energy sector, to extend services to the rural communities. Of course, it's a loss of revenue, but you can also look at it from the other way, that maybe this is government giving back to the people, because maybe if they had collected this money, mm -hmm. it would have gone back to the same thing. But let me explain. I think government can allow this loss 
under circumstances where it sees that the benefit that is going to come from the solar extension by these private companies is worth is worth the loss of the taxes. Okay. Um, think of the various benefits that come from using renewable energies like solar. Mm. These cut across different areas, social, economic, and, and environmental, as we've been discussing. So imagine that I have a solar home system in my village, okay? Mm. And I have a family, let's say, of young children uh, with me who are going to school. If I don't have the solar system, school work will stop at five after they have left the school. Once they are home and we are in darkness, no more. No more work. But with the solar light, then they can extend their, their study hours. And of course, this will, this will, include their, their, they will improve their academic performance. Okay. That is one benefit. But there are other benefits. Think of safety and security issues. Many people from experience use solar not just for lighting inside their homes, but for lighting outside their homes, especially when you go to the rural areas. Mm. And in remote places, you find one house is here, another one house is very far. This outdoor lighting is one of the reasons why most people actually adopt the solar systems, because of security. It provides security. You can see if there is a thief coming, big benefit. But also, when you have such systems, for people who are who, who, uh, who know how to make money, they can translate that into home production. So in the evening, I come back and I want to make my chapati for selling tomorrow, or my pancake for selling tomorrow. I use that opportunity of the light that I have from the solar for home production, and then tomorrow I go and sell. So just to say that there are many benefits, economic, social, and beyond, okay. even environmental. Okay, that is for solar, but for biogas, for example, transitioning from using firewood to biogas, the benefits are there. Now, what the government would normally do, or what I think that the government does when they are determining whether to give incentives and give uh, and not take taxes from renewable energy, is weighing the social benefits. If now people are not going, many people are not going to fall sick because they have transitioned from using firewood, which is polluting to using biogas, the government is benefiting indirectly. Usually the government doesn't have to buy many drugs and send to those, to those uh, health centers in the villages. Why? Because fewer people are now falling sick. That's an indirect benefit, and I think the government will look at this when they're determining the incentives. Again, it's not just health, it's other issues. Government has its targets on, on gender, for example. Mm -hmm. If by using biogas instead of fewer wood, it is helping to reach its gender targets, then I think the government will consider that. So what I think the government is doing, or what I think it should be doing, is that it is going to weigh these benefits. It is difficult to quantify social benefits into, my, into monetary terms. Mm. But I think somehow they, they, they should weigh them and say the benefits are growing from, from these incentives we have given that have extended renewable energy to the villages or to the remote areas far outweigh the money that we would have collected in taxes, and therefore we, we think it's the right thing to do. However, as, as, as my last comment on that, I think one of the challenges that we have with the incentives, even with taxation, mm. is that they are not targeted. Okay. They do not necessarily benefit the people that most need those incentives, okay? And therefore would provide the highest value of money. So if you have incentives that are general, me who can afford a solar system, no matter how expensive it is, I also benefit from an incentive that is supposed to help the person who is struggling, who is economically not strong, and therefore need help from the government to be able to afford a solar system. So I think that the incentives that are put forward, it would be very helpful if they are targeted to those who most need it. Okay. I think that would be most beneficial and would create the highest value for money uh, for, for the government. All right, you talked about targeted incentives and then basically taxation. To council, yes, when, when you look at East Africa, I guess earlier on mentioned uh, Kenya, uh, there are big, big players in regard to the renewable energy space. Likewise, when you look at Tanzania, 
it's one of the countries that have been utilizing their natural resources. When you talk about gas, it's a key player. And even when you look at the eco and then the ongoing uh, energy, rather oil sector developments, it's a very big player. I'm interested in understanding, are there any particular lessons that we can borrow, maybe in regard to policy, uh, how it can be applied, and then any spectacular areas? Are there any lessons that we can learn from Tanzania and maybe Kenya in regard to the uptake of the energy uh, sources to power areas such as agriculture, to power uh, transport, we're talking about immobility, and then something is even coming up later, uh, later next year when the next financial year starts, that's biofuels. Are there any particular takeaways that you would look at? Uh, I would speak basically for Kenya because mm -hmm. I've been to Nairobi, there's an event I was attending, it was a launch for agrobotics and they are doing it at a large scale down there. Uh, what they are doing, the investors are coming in, they are extending solar panels mm. to the farmers, setting up the systems. So what the farmers do, they can plant cereal crops, maybe like cabbages, those small, small crops under the solar panels. So in turn, the solar panels provide light okay. as a source of energy. The solar panels in turn also power uh, water. They pump water for home consumption okay. as well as irrigation for the crops. So it's more of an interplay of food, uh, solar, and then water for consumption. So. I found it quite amusing. I, I would wish that maybe it can come to Uganda because uh, what Kenya is doing, they're uplifting the renewable energy that side and empowering the farmers, the local farmers, okay. not necessarily looking at, oh, this one has to, the person who is able to get a solar is also benefiting, but going down to the roots, to the local people. So in turn, they are able to sell this produce, uh, educate their children. And also, another initiative we can look at is uniform implementation of policies. Because what I observed in Kenya, I didn't see more of polythenes. But with Uganda, you look at, there have been several bans on polythenes, but you walk into a supermarket, they'll give you a polythene. They'll give you bread in a polythene. They'll give you water in plastic. The other side, there's nothing like plastic. There's nothing like, it. once it's a ban, it's a ban. Fully implemented. Yes. So I feel like Uganda can look at the adoption of such initiatives to cap down on the faces. All right. We're running out of time, but uh, as we conclude, Councillor, I'll throw this to you. She just mentioned something about agrovoltics. And this is basically, it calls for technology, innovation, and all that uh, regards to that space. There is research and development. In your own perspective, where are we standing right now? That's for me, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, thanks. Um, of course, research and development is very important for any transition. I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the drivers of renewable of energy transition before was uh, technological innovation. But for any innovation to come up, you need sustained periods of research and development. True. Okay. And so even now, the the renewable energy technologies that are being talked about now, uh, the wind, the solar, they had to go through long periods of research and development for them to reach where they are. Even though, for example, like solar, we, we are not yet where we are. You know that the current efficiency of a solar, of commercial scale solar panels, is around 15 to 20 percent, or maybe up to 23 percent. Mm -hmm. What that means is that the solar panels we use today convert only 20 
around 20% of the sunlight into usable energy that we, that we actually use, the commercial scale. Of course, there's research ongoing. Uh, I think at the laboratory scale, there are some researchers who have come up with a solar cell that can um, that has an efficiency of around 50%, but it's not yet commercial. Mm -hmm. Just to show you that these technologies have come through research, but they still need research to be improved. That's from a technological perspective. But of course, there is also research required from the social perspective, from the economic perspective, environmental perspective. We need, for example, to understand how our renewable energies contribute to socioeconomic development mm -hmm. as compared to, say, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. This research is necessary. How are communities accepting renewable energies and what can we do to make these uh, renewable energies that are being resisted, for example, to be accepted in the communities? So research is very important, not only from the technical innovation, where we need an innovative solution, but also from the social, economic, and environmental. As Uganda, I must say that, um, uh, unfortunately, we are only at the early stages when it comes to research and development. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the key reasons why we may struggle with transition. Because if we are going to always rely on imported technology, it's going to be expensive for us to transition. Okay. And that technology that we bring, sometimes we'll find that it doesn't necessarily fit the local context. Okay. So we we'll have to uh, struggle a lot and invest a lot into research and development. I know that there is already some, some effort. There is this Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, but also some universities uh, like, like Macquarie University Business School, where I come from, we have started to take that direction, okay, to do research on how can we support energy transition uh, from, let's say, an economic perspective, from a management perspective, but also from a technical perspective. So, Unfortunately, we are still in the early stages, mm -hmm. but I know that there are some efforts that are ongoing, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll start to see good innovations coming out, and those which are already out and need scaling should also be supported. Let there be support for research and innovation, and beyond that, there be, let there be support for upscaling, market entry, commercialization, and so on and so forth. This is what is going to encourage many people to innovate, because if I innovate today, and I'm not seeing my product going into the market, tomorrow I may not think of going into innovation. I will think of, oh, let me go do something else. But if I innovate today and I end up going into the market, my product goes there, other innovators will be encouraged to follow suit, and, and then we'll see kind of a, a replication of these innovations and new innovations coming up, which will help in, in, in the development of the country. All right, thank you so much. Because of time, the conversation won't get any further than this, but generally it's been in regard to how best can the energy transition uh, transform the water, food, uh, connectivity, or you could call it a nexus uh, of the sort. So when you, when you look at uh, the stats, you are looking at the agricultural market getting even extremely big by 2030. When you look at the stats, they point to a one trillion US dollar market. But how best can this market be achieved when we have issues to do with climate change, uh, challenges regarding access to energy for the different sectors? You're looking at transport itself, you're looking at agriculture, among other areas. So it's a conversation that cannot get uh, exhausted. But for now, we shall put it to a hold. I've been in conversation with Council Namanda Hilda. Uh, Majorin and then Dr. Paul Nduhura, who is an expert in energy and as well as a lecturer at Macquarie University. So, to all those that have been hooked onto the program, I say good night and Merry Christmas. Uh, I hope I'm not so early to wish you that. So, good night for now. <laughs>